I think it's just really important to say that Southwark themselves see this as very much the start of the community's involvement with this with this um, with this redevelopment. So up to up to now, they've been they've had certain processes, but what they're really keen now to do is get the community's you know perspectives on the bids and what what is needed for the future of the town hall. Um, so each of the two bidders, Castle Forge Partners and General Projects, will then make um, a presentation of they promised me no longer than 15 minutes. And after both bidders have presented, what we're going to do then is going to have an opportunity to ask, ask questions. So we'll have a session where we can ask questions of both of the bidders. And if you can at all, just, to, just in terms of fairness, apart from questions of clarification, if you try and make sure that you ask each of them equally sort of open questions so they all get a chance to you know, speak to that issue that you've raised, that would be great. Um, and yeah, so we hope for help, they'll respond to each question, and then and then after that, we, after we've, we've had all the questions have gone through to the bidders, councillor Situ and um, probably John are going to ask, answer questions from Southwark's point of view about the issues that you know that, that you feel that Southwark need to address in relation to the redevelopment. And obviously, we'll we'll close then with Johnson, then just recapping where we've got to and where he sees it going forward. So, very, I promise this won't take much longer now. So, aim to finish by nine o'clock. Um, just to say that the meeting is being filmed. So, if there's anybody who's got a problem with it, you know, just so it can go on the website so there's a public record of what's on. If anyone's got a problem with being filmed, if you could speak to Gillian, is that, or just let us know. Yeah, so. Yeah, and if, you, and if you do want to leave your details so that Southwark can keep you updated with what's going on, obviously the Royal Society will do all we can to tell people what's there's a There's a sort of signing in sheet with email address contacts that, um, that at the back. Oh, at the back table. At the back table. Yeah, so if you want to fill in and get information from Southwark, please do that. Um, let everybody speak, please, you know, let's keep this nice and friendly and polite. Um, please, please, if you want to make points about what you've heard, please do them, but try and, try and, try and end up with a question, because I think what we're trying to do is elicit as much information, both from the two bidders as possible and from Southwark, so please always try and make sure there's a question in there somewhere. Um, yeah, so that, that's it really. So just to say, there's going to be after this, there's going to be two further sessions where um, people have got the opportunities to look at the bids. There's a session tomorrow afternoon, or again here between three and five. Then on Saturday morning between twelve and two, the bidders are going to be here with the boards. Um, and what the Walworth Society is going to do, we're going to absolutely listen to what everybody says. And Sheila is taking, thank you, Sheila is taking detailed minutes of what what gets said. And our meeting on the third of January will be about what we feel, will be devoted to what we feel we've heard and what how we'd like to respond before the consultation ends on the 21st of January. And I think that's it really. So what I'd like to do now is thank you again all for coming and I'd like to invite Councillor Situ to come and describe Southwark's role in this. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeremy. Um, just to introduce myself, my name's Johnson Situ. Um, as, as Jeremy quite rightly said, I am a councillor and I've also recently taken on the position of uh, Cabinet Member for Growth, Development and Planning. Um, and so part of that role is very much looking at how we uh, set planning policy, but also how we encourage growth and crucially how we ensure growth works for local people and that growth is shared. And, and uh, you know, Jeremy's quite rightly said, I'm going to talk about the process in respect of um, the Woolworth Town Hall um, and a process moving forward. But I thought it would be important to take a step back a little bit and just to talk about the Woolworth Road generally. Um, and for me, my, you know, growing up in the area, I've had many visits along the Woolworth Road, but I, I, I always reflect on some of the fantastic uh, both festivals and activities and also uh, buildings and institutions right along. Uh, the Woolworth Road. So whether we think of the Woolworth Festival, I know with the Woolworth Society organise uh, Friends of uh, Paisley Park, the event, annual event that goes on. And, and I, I hear most recently uh, Cuban African dancing, which was a hit and was, was packed out as well. You know, there is no doubt Woolworth Road is a destination and Woolworth Road will continue to be a destination. But I, I think it's also important to talk about the vision for Woolworth Road. And 
our vision for Woolworth Road, I, I imagine many people in this room's vision for the Woolworth Road, is to ensure that, yes, it has a number of thriving businesses and the commerce continues, but increasingly it continues to be a destination. And it continues to uh, plays on its strength, both in terms of the Woolworth Town Hall, but over, over, uh, further down the road in terms of St Peter's, and also uh, uh, some of the destinations right across Woolworth Road. So part of that vision, a key part of that vision I've just talked about, is Woolworth Town Hall. Um, you know, just to talk through the process, in an ideal situation, as you all know, uh, after the fire, in an ideal situation, our first priority was to explore how could we deliver something as a council? How could we explore um, both delivering some of the fantastic cultural institutions such as library and, and community space? How can we deliver on that? And that was always our first port of call. But after doing some further investigation, the, the cost, the sheer cost of delivering uh, the all of the community facilities and all of the facilities within the town hall, uh, which competing with uh, priorities and, and increasing cuts right across our services, meant that it just wasn't feasible in being able to deliver it. So, you know, we agreed uh, a new project mandate uh, in 2017 and went out to uh, look for expressions of interest. We received a number of expressions of interest and following a process of looking at all of those expressions of interest. We've uh, invited three companies to proceed to uh, further uh, put forward proposals. Um, one, uh, one of those, uh, those organisations pulled out, so uh, two projects have moved forward as you've just had a chance to, to look both in terms of Castle Forge and general projects. But one point I would like to underscore, this process in terms of the engagement process over the next few weeks it's hugely important because we know that um, the War of Town Hall over the years has worked well, best when it's been at the heart of the community, offering community space, but also uh, working as a community hub as well. And in recent years, you've had the Art Academy here as well, um, and, and, and they've been able to engage with the local community. So moving forward, we're really keen, and uh, you know, Jeremy's alluded to this, but we're really keen to hear as many, from as many people, both in respect of this event, but moving forward as well. The expectation is when we've, you know, over the, after the next few weeks, is that a decision will, a proposed the proposal will be, uh, will be assessed, taken in consideration, the feedback from local communities, and a paper will be going to cabinet sometime in uh, spring, March uh, 2019. But I, it's also important to stress once it then goes to cabinet, there will still be. Uh, opportunities to still feed in your thoughts as it will go through the planning process as well. Some questions have come forward over recent weeks in terms of how do we ensure whichever project is successful, and you'll hear from presentation shortly, that Woolworth Road is not forgotten and Woolworth Road remains a central part of uh, the borough and remains a destination and remains a place for commerce and and creativity as well. You know, it's fair to say that there's change right across the borough and you know, just up the road there's change in Elephant Castle and just down the road there's change uh, in Campbell as well. And acknowledging some of the concerns and acknowledging the questions, uh, one of the things I'm happy to commit to today is, a, is developing a plan with local community, with local businesses for the Woolworth Road to ensure that we are strategic in uh, the the aim of making Woolworth Road to be, continue to be a destination. And over the next weeks, we'll be happy to come back in a further meeting to be able to highlight those plans. I'll end on this note. Um, today, you're going to hear from two projects, um, but the engagement process uh, starts today, but does not end today. And over the next few weeks, I hope uh, you'll be able to engage in a full and frank way. If you do have any ideas as to how we can go further in terms of engagement or other ways of engaging, both in terms of online or in, both in, 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 a, in a physical format, please feel free to let us know. Um, I hope you do ask full and, uh, full and frank discussions. I hope, full and frank questions. I hope you do uh, go above and beyond in trying to get engaged as well. Um, as a council, we will, uh, listen and we will await uh, the feedback from today and, and look forward to coming again in, in the future to be able to discuss uh, some of the plans moving forward for the Woolworth Road. Thank you.
So, yeah, do you want to switch it back on again then? Okay. So I'd like to welcome Castle Forge now. And please, can I just suggest that whatever happens, you just let them go through, the, both bidders go through the presentation to allow them the momentum. So even if there's points of clarification, let's pick those up in the Q&A and just let them make the presentation. Thank you. All right, well, welcome tonight. Um, we are here to talk about buildings uh, and uh, the town hall specifically. Um, so I want to, uh, you to understand that from our perspective, um, while we understand that some people in the world just think of buildings as pieces of stone or you know, lots of bricks stacked together and combined with mortar or glass and steel or whatever it is, uh, we think buildings can be so much more um, rather than just a pile of their elements stacked on top of each other. Um, some buildings can define countries or neighborhoods. Um, when you think of a building like um, the Parliament Building in the UK, uh, it, it, how does that not sort of conjure up all of the history and heritage and culture that Britain, Britain has to offer the world and all that sort of embodied in just a building? You know, buildings inspire us, and I think buildings especially in this sort of, hopefully we get that across tonight, buildings have the power to transform an area um, and to transform a community. Um, so I want you to imagine what that sort of transformation looks like right here in Southwark. Um, imagine that revitalized community life um, transformation entirely centered around the Walworth Town Hall. And what I'm going to try to do here, uh, first invite our architect, architect squire and partners up, um, Tim, to give you an overview of what we propose at the Walworth Town Hall from a technical perspective and from an architectural perspective. And then after, I'm going to come back up and describe how we see that transformation of the town hall happening and how we think it's more than just a new set of bricks and windows and a roof. I'm going to describe how we see this project as a real powerful way to transform uh, Walworth. So go ahead, Tim. Great. Thank you, Michael. Good evening, everybody. Um, Tim Bledstone from Squire and Partners. Um, right in front of you is uh, our vision of uh, seeing the Walworth, Walworth Town Hall coming back to life, um, a public building, but also functioning um, uh, as a workspace as well and I think now's a really exciting time where the way we live, work, um, culturally engage with each other is actually probably almost closer to how this building was conceived of at the beginning with lots of um, uh, cultural activities happening within the building. I think what's wonderful about Elephant and Castle with its established communities that you all know um, better than I do, um, but there's actually a huge growing creative um, series of groups that we want to draw upon. Um, we've obviously got the um, Elephant Park uh, master plan with lend -Lease, and what's great about that is now immediately outside there's a new square um, and the whole master plan gives a new um, frontage to this building which was almost designed in at the beginning but we can bring back to life. Um, the, the existing building is, is stunning in both its uh, how it was conceived at the time, but also um, in its disrepair. It has a certain amount of charm, um, but uh, we are slightly experts at working with listed buildings and working with opportunities. And we've done, we've done this for ourselves um, at our own offices in an old department store in Brixton. This period is an amazing period of arts and crafts. And the, the further you dig into these little details, the symbolism and meaning is there in every detail. And we want to build upon that. So our kind of core values we've worked up as a team is to, first and foremost, on, on the left is work on building heritage. Um, and we want to work with everyone that knows anything about this building to amplify and celebrate everything there is to know. We want to go back to that last word I just used, celebration. Um, this building was used, I mean, it had the library, but it had um, many other town hall functions, uh, like civic weddings. Um, and events, debating, council chamber, but the chamber being used even more than that is something that we think would be great. To keep amplifying city and nature and our relationship to nature, um, we're going to celebrate the gaps between the buildings um, and, and the relationship to the, the new square. Um, build upon the arts, the education um, and exhibitions um, and let that be at the heart um, of what's happening here with the sort of creative industries. Um, and slightly boldly, um, enjoy the fact this building is going to be a phoenix. It's rising literally from the ashes. Um, bits of it's 
are, are perfect, other bits are, do have to rise from the ashes and, and enjoy its, its next life um, even stronger than before. So as you walk through the building, as you arrive, um, we want to embrace the three um, entrances and make those work well. Um, as you can come through the main formal front door, um, there'll be a sequence of spaces that enjoy that space. Um, in the back corner, um, which will be looking onto the new uh, square, um, there will be a restaurant that will be fully open to the public um, throughout the day from bre breakfast, lunch and dinner into the evening. Um, having the restaurant, that enables the whole building to be serviced through that facility. Um, and there'll be a central atrium, um, which again will be fully open to the public. There will be an inside-outside space. You realise you're in the old back courtyards of the building that have been filled in, but this will be a, a, a tranquil oasis that's for everyone to enjoy. Um, what we call the Newington Suite is actually the, um, the, the library space above us, which will be more like a, um, a, a library as a study. Um, and this will be more flexible um, study space where you don't need to just co-work to use a desk. Um, anyone can come and, and pay a lighter uh, uh, fee to use this facility. Um, the council chamber will be um, reinstated almost to how it is, again with a new um, layer, but um, to allow other fa facilities to happen. So we're thinking it could be uh, a, a, a debating chamber available for local groups, but go on and be a music chamber, and that could be for primary school children all the way through to established um, musicians. Um, it can be a presentation chamber, TED Talks, um, event space and assembly space, um, a really special um, facility that would be available for anybody to come and use, and, and that would have um, almost some charity uses as well as um, commercial uses. Um, beneath us, there will be a, um, where we are now, there will be an, uh, an education making space, workshop space, which will be um, tapping into the art groups, um, and this will be a space that um, is transformative. It, it's, it can be used for making and doing, but it can also be used for exhibitions, and it has the benefits of also the, the, the light well to the front and accessibility to the streets. And to really sort of finish off, um, this is sort of the vision as you see it from Woolworth Square. Hopefully it will get more and more busy, um, and more and more populous, a real frontage to the building um, that has, has been hidden away for many years. And I think the route through from the station um, and the success of Elephant Park as it matures, um, this is a, is a tranquil space um, playing off the, the thriving activity of um, Woolworth Road. Thank you. I'll hand back to Michael. Great. Thanks a lot, Tim. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that, uh, that we want to try to get across, and I hope you have from Tim's conversation, that uh, we certainly want to see how all the different uses we plan for the building are able to reflect on um, the history and the heritage uh, here in Walworth in the area, and Walworth's unique history and the potential for its future, really. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is connect some of that history and heritage to some of the uses that we have in the building, and I'll walk you through what we plan for it. Um, so, I bet you know this, since many of you are with the Walworth Society, um, that uh, some of the most important scientists and creative minds in world history called Walworth home. So Charles Babbage, who many consider to be the father of uh, modern computing, lived here in Walworth um, uh, over 150 years ago. And Babbage formulated the concept for what was to become 100 years later, basically a computer. Uh, and he came up with that idea 100 years before the 1940s. Uh, so industry, and especially creative industry, has always been at the center of the Walworth community. Um, and it's with that in mind, with that heritage in mind, that we intend to create a hub of creative industry right here in the town hall uh, of our own. So we intend to provide office spaces that suits all shapes and sizes of businesses, from single person desks, or as Tim said, you can just come in for the day and, uh, or the month and, and hire out some of the space. Um, that being sort of the real driver behind the economic engine here, uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises. And it's not only office space that we want to ha have here at the town hall. Um, we also want to have a maker space for, for skilled craft work. So, you know, one of the things that may, maybe a lot of you know is that the loss of studios for artists across London is of such a great concern that it's featured in um, an artist workspace study by the GLA. Um, also, I know Southwark's cultural strategy paper has made reference to the loss of artist studio space. And I think we, pro we, we aim to provide um, that space to provide the tools for you know, jewelry and pottery and arts and crafts, but even all the way up to machines for 3D printing, sort of the, the, the future of artist and, and make space. 
Uh, and all these are really expensive if one person wanted to buy them on their own. But when we provide these items uh, for the community to hire out at a subsidized cost, it's very low because we're all sharing the use of that maker space. So, um, so, so, that, so it's not only sort of the creative side, but it's also the, the creative making side. And most importantly, I think the question you're going to ask uh, for all of this office space is how do we intend to actually manage this? Because it is, it is a real, um, it is a real uh, endeavor. Well, thankfully, we're not only developers of property, but we are also managers of our own serviced office business, Castle Forge. Um, we have offices all around the country. We started over in Glasgow, and we opened up in Belfast last month. Um, we open up in Liverpool next month. Um, and we're adding, we've added Hackney to our list over at Hagerston, and we hope to include Walworth in that. Um, you can Google us. Uh, we're at www.workclockwise.co.uk. The company's called Clockwise. So you can see pictures of what we offer in Glasgow. But let me give you sort of an example of what some of the businesses in our Glasgow operation look like. Um, we have all types of businesses, from accounting to services to computer coding and education. And in fact, there's even a, well, they started as a two-person business, now they're six, um, that specialize in artificial intelligence. Uh, our average size customer up in Glasgow is actually less than 10 employees. So really importantly, these are the small and medium-sized enterprises that, 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 that drive uh, the area's industry forward. And I think, you know, when, when we look at this, having 500, six, 700 people uh, working here every day in our creative office and maker hub is, is something that, you know, you can then look to the history and the, and the heritage of Walworth and say that somebody like Charles Babbage would be really proud of that. Um, so, so that's on the on, that's on the that's on the creative industry side. Um, what about learning? Um, well, uh, some people uh, may not know, but many of you probably do, that Michael Faraday, one of the earliest scientists uh, working with electricity, was was a resident here of Walworth. Um, so Faraday was actually born to a family that 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 couldn't afford expensive formal education around the time that he was born. So he basically had to teach himself everything through books and through reading and through experiencing life. And you know, he read so much and studied so much, and he had such a commitment towards learning that uh, even with no formal education, uh, he became a very prominent member of the, uh, the British Royal Society. So, so we think that sort of that tradition, that heritage for, for learning is something that we want to bring into our vision for the revitalization of the town hall. Um, you've all seen our proposal for the newly reimagined uh, Newington Suite, as we call it, which is right here. Um, we want to encourage uh, this to be the focal point of educational seminars and events that we're going to hold. But we also want the uh, public uh, to be encouraged to take part too. You know, we think Walworth has such a diverse community with so many different experts in all different types of areas that we think drawing on the local community to form the core of that learning hub is going to be ideal. So you heard it here first. We're calling on all local residents to help us consider the types of events that you want and that we can put on here that will range, I think, and we can have the we have the we have the space for it and the availability for it, uh, for formal talks to film screenings and performances to arts and crafts workshops and classes, cooking classes, wine tasting, supper club, um, more informal sort of networking discussions, you name it. But I think that you know we would want to use the space also in the functioning library for book launches, poetry readings, book clubs, etc. But the important thing, I think, is that this is your learning space. This is Walworth Community's learning, Walworth Community's learning space. And we want you to help make the likes of you know, such prominent figures like Michael Faraday proud because they know that the community is and always sort of has been the center of, um, of real learning opportunities around, uh, around Southwark. OK, lastly, there's arts and culture. Um, many of you know um, some of Walworth's famous past residents, uh, including Charlie Chaplin, Michael Caine, and comedian Bill Bailey. Uh, Samuel Palmer, the famous artist, as well as the famous poet Robert Browning once hailed here in Walworth. So, you know, I think it's clear to us when we were going through a lot of our analysis and a lot of our research and history that uh, art and culture is always featured very prominently historically in Walworth. Um, and so why wouldn't this town hall revitalization be the perfect opportunity to place that history of culture and, and center stage? I mean, literally right here in the case of the council chamber. Um, you, you'll sort of have seen from our proposals that this council chamber can be used to hold musical concerts and small performances. Um, and when it comes to art, 
you know, I'd like to imagine right here at Walworth we can do what other places all around London have done. Um, creative partnerships are things that we can form with, there's a company, there are charities like Art Angel. It's an organization that organize, organizes art installations in unusual spaces. Um, there's a group called Location House, which offers spaces for film, fashion, and other cultural purposes. And I think that that would sort of help to cement the town hall's reputation as a center for art London-wide. Now, Adam and I have already spoken to a group called Outset, and their director has done a huge amount of work to help artists find affordable art and studio space um, all across London. And Outset is, is basically saying that they're willing to help us curate our space um, with artists through a matchmaking service. And what I think actually Adam's idea was really creative. Um, we're going to provide some of our serviced offices that we manage for free to the artists at Outset. And what they're going to do is in return provide um, a curation and education program suitable for the public to use in the Newington suite and an events program in the council chamber uh, for arts and performances and theater. Um, but look, those are only suggestions, and I know I'm no art expert and by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we know that Walworth has an artist community of its own, so let's not, um, let's not, uh, let, let, let's not sort of presume. Uh, I think we would want to feature those local artists uh, very prominently here. And so what that would mean is a, is a constant rotation of artworks from local artists and art schools um, for display in the community areas and the reception. And I think that would allow sort of the local artists to access that world stage that, that we think that the Walworth Town Hall can become. Um, so I think whether, uh, I hope I've done enough of a, of a, good, a good enough job laying out what, what, what the Castle Forge proposal is, and no doubt you'll have questions. But I just want to sum up saying, you know, from creating a center for creative local industries uh, and SMEs to building a foundation for a world-class education, arts and culture hub, and providing space for the community to hire out, to take part in a whole variety of events, um, such as, and let's not forget ceremonies and, and weddings. I, I, was, I got married at Marlebone Town Hall, so I understand how important town halls are, are to, to, to those moments in our lives. Um, you can see just exactly how we think the transformation of the Walworth Town Hall will mean more than just having basically a new set of bricks and windows and a roof. Uh, I think you, the community, now have the opportunity to use the restoration of, of Walworth Town Hall, uh, a project that you know, we think is it's, it's, it's going to be a real undertaking of, of millions of pounds, probably 20 million pounds, but as an agent to powerfully transform what's on offer to residents here in Walworth. Um, you know, and if today's community, if the discussions that I've been having um, is, is anything indicative of, a, as, you know, as vibrant as, as it is and, and has been historically based on the residents that have lived here in the past from all walks of life, you know, then I think we'd really be honored to be chosen to work with the community to capitalize on that real possible transformation. So thanks very much and, um, you know, no doubt I will turn it over to you guys. I don't know what format you want to... Thank you very much. Hey, thanks. <laughs> So now I'd like to welcome Jacob from General Projects to present their vision. Tilt the projector up. I think we're losing a bit of the bottom of the screen. Otherwise, we can try and we can bootstrap it. Thank you. 
If everyone is happy to make do with a small amount of compromise, we're fine with it. <laughs> cool. Um, wanted to start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Jacob Loftus. Uh, I'm the uh, founder and CEO of General Projects. Um, we're the other developer um, hoping to have the honor of restoring and revitalizing the Woolworth Town Hall. Um, I wanted to start um, by just kicking off really with a, a bit of an introduction of, about who we are as a business. Um, we were set up three years ago. Uh, for the seven years before that, um, I was running the UK business for another property company. During that 10 year span, um, I've been uh, one thing only, uh, which is focused on um, developing real estate for the creative industries and pretty much doing just about uh, only the transformation of heritage buildings into mixed-use hubs that have become home to creative businesses, startup businesses, SMEs, artists, makers, uh, everywhere from Lewisham to uh, Whitechapel, uh, Kensal Rise, uh, into the middle of the city of London. On pretty much every project we do, and I'm going to show you a couple, um, we are only interested in how we can transform buildings into vibrant, creative, innovative hubs that are completely designed uh, around creating something amazing for people. And that's as much about the people who work in our buildings day to day uh, as it is about the people who live around them. You know, we are wholly believers in inclusive development and trying to create places that are really sustainable and you know, real um, for the people that are going to interact with them. I thought it was just useful just to start by showing you two or three of our projects, just to kind of put that into context so you can see what we're about and what we do. Um, this is a building in Finsbury Square, just on the edge of the city of London. It was built in the 1920s um, for the Royal London Insurance Company. Unfortunately, uh, as you can see from the beautiful heritage building on the outside, uh, unfortunately, in the 1980s, uh, a slightly corporate uh, somewhat uninspiring refurbishment was done of the inside uh, and it subsequently became uh, a slightly disinteresting secondary corporate office building. We bought it with a vision to transform it into an absolutely grade A benchmark uh, creative office building that would hopefully uh, set a completely new standard for how people should be working in the 21st century in London. Um, so over the space of two years and £50 million pounds later, we did a comprehensive refurbishment of the building, transformed the atrium into a vibrant, active place, which really formed the heart and soul of the building. Uh, the whole ground floor of the atrium became a public space, not just for the businesses that work there, but public for anyone and everyone uh, from 6 o'clock in the morning to 8 p.m. at night. It housed a coffee shop, uh, event space, uh, revolving art galleries, um, all sitting within a, what was an office building above. Um, the businesses that came in here were everyone from WPP, the UK's biggest advertising agency at the top, to a startup hub that we set up in the ground and lower ground floor that was home to 150 small startup companies, some of which you know, had only created and set up you know, three weeks before. Um, user experience, health and well-being is something we think about on all of our projects. So this building included a yoga studio in the basement that was free to use. Um, it had 300 bike spaces so everyone could ride their, ride their bike to work every day. And as you can see from the picture in the bottom right hand corner, you know, we really wanted to celebrate that and built a 50 meter ramp that you actually ride your bike into every single day. Um, another example, this is a building uh, in Mile End. Um, in the 1920s, when it was built as the Wickham's department store, it was kind of locally known as the Harrods of the East. Uh, huge heritage, hugely, hugely proud, hugely important. Um, when we bought it, it unfortunately had been somewhat unloved and forgotten about for a very long time uh, and was sitting in a very poor state of repair. Our vision for this building was, could we take a part of East London that was not known for workspace was not known for SMEs, was not, you know, anything like Shoreditch or Whitechapel or some of the, you know, fashionable places where people are doing interesting, innovative things with buildings and do something that was sustainable, genuine and would bring this building back to 
active use and, and, and restore it. Um, so in just six months from buying it, we'd refurbished three quarters of the building as a workspace hub. We had 200 startup companies fill it within three months of us finishing the work. Everything from a small scale uh, make your own computer company called Cano, uh, which is now the world's biggest producer of uh, component computer parts that are easy enough for a six year old child to put it together and learn to start programming by plugging it into its TV. All the way through to Microsoft Ventures who no one ever thought would come to Mile End, but they bought into the vision and, and they came and joined us as well. Um, at the heart of this building was a vibrant event space that we had huge numbers of different programs going on every weekend that were as much for the local community as for the people working in the building. Uh, and at the ground floor was a low cost, but really good coffee shop and cafe, which everyone who lived in lived around the building seemed to frequent on a almost weekly basis. Um, just finally, because I won't dwell on it too much, uh, these are some of our more recent projects. Um, on the left-hand side is Number One Poultry, um, James Sterling Building um, at the heart of the City of London, the bastion of finance. Uh, as you can see, Mr. Sterling, when he built it, was not uh, a fan of conventional glass and steel buildings and decided to do something much more architecturally interesting. Uh, we had the honour of being the custodians to undertake a refurbishment of it. Um, the building was grade two star listed just when we started the works. So we spent the last two years working closely with uh, Heritage England on um, what is the first refurbishment of the youngest listed building ever in the UK. Um, next door to that is a, an, a gin distillery and a former bank in the middle of Clerkenwell that we're just starting work on at the moment. And interestingly, for the last two years, while we've been working up our plans, we gave 100% of the building away to uh, an artist studio group for free. Um, and the building played home to uh, 200 artists for 18 months who were given amazing galleries, you know, amazing studio space in the middle of London, you know, at a time, as Michael said, when artist studios are disappearing, you know, in every corner of the city. Um, in the middle of Lewisham, we're just finishing the restoration of Tower House, which was the original home of the uh, Royal Arsenal Cooperative Society. Again, had been sitting in disrepair, and that's going to become a workspace, uh, community and SME hub. Um, and then the Woolworth, the, the original headquarters of Woolworths um, in Marlebone. Um, joining us on this journey are Fikes and Merlin, um, a young, dynamic, innovative architectural practice who I think share our spirit and vision of trying to do something you know, really interesting uh, and innovative with buildings, but other than just you know, their young and innovative drive, they're steeped in experience of working with complicated listed buildings um, you know, and have a deep understanding of heritage around that. And then finally, the team we've put around us are London's leading historic buildings, consultants, planning consultants, engineers and designers, all of whom we've worked with across many of our projects and all of whom have deep experience in restoring listed and heritage assets. So, onto the building. Um, we've tried to distill this as much as we can because we've spent the last six months um, talking about a million and one ideas for, for what we dream about doing to this building. Um, I think it wasn't clear from what we do. We are so passionate about uh, historic buildings and trying to reinvent them into something that forges a new life and a new character and a new opportunity to, to do something special. Um, when we look at the Woolworth Town Hall from the outside and in, every part of the external architecture, as well as the you know, dilapidated features within the building, are full of character and provide the most unbelievable backdrop to start thinking about what it could could become again in the future. Um, we've spent a huge amount of time uh, understanding the history of this building and the history of the area. And I think the thing that sticks with us most is that for the last 150 years, this building has been the central focal hub of this community uh, and has really been you know, a beating heart. And obviously since the fire and things, since things have evolved, you know, that's no longer the case. And whilst um, a huge amount of money is needed to restore this building, ensuring that it remains a genuine community hub, I think is one of the, the absolute key ambitions, and we'll talk through how we're going to achieve that in a moment. 
And then finally, as you've seen, we're all about SMEs, creative industries, arts, and finding ways to deliver huge amounts of that space for a very broad mix of businesses uh, in a way that's commercially viable. Our approach uh, is pretty simple. We love what's here, we want to restore it, we want to enhance it, we want to make it accessible, and we want to breathe a new life into it. We don't want to be interventionist in the building, we want to undertake work in the lightest manner possible so we can preserve what's here, but at the same time, we want to reshape the internal facilities and make the necessary changes to ensure we modernize the building and give it a lease of life for the next 50 years. And finding the balance between the two is, is hugely important. Um, there are two separate buildings here, and I think a key part of our vision is how we stitch the two together and create a central hub for the building in between the two that is really the meeting space and the active beating heart for the people who will work here and for the community that will be engaging in it in lots of different ways. Um, the two things that I suppose we want to change and we want to be open and upfront about it are one of the ways in which you get into the building. So both entrances on Woolworth Road will remain open and active throughout the year, 365 days. But there is an enormous investment going into Woolworth Square. It's already finished. It is a really fantastic and unique piece of public infrastructure that you very rarely see something of that quality happen in London. And we think there's an opportunity to open up uh, that side of the building create a wide sweeping new staircase so that the building and the square interact with one another in a very natural way. We're conscious in projects where there's a, a public and private dynamic that the private can often overtake the public and the ways in which you come in and out of the building and how naturally inviting that feels or not dictates how much the community feels that they own the building. And so for us, you know, enhancing a big sweeping wide new entrance that feels permeable and open is a you know a major physical transformation but also a metaphorical one to show you know really what we're trying to create with this building and then as i mentioned how we stitch the two buildings together in the new courtyard that we create in the middle you know will provide you know a real new central meeting place it will be fully open to the public at all times but also allows us to create a new circulation lift and staircase that makes sure the building is fully accessible to disabled users, which is vital, and also allows us to have a very neat place where we can install heating, air conditioning, and electricity, which is all going to be very important to make it work without having to punch holes all the way through the building in a way that would you know, undermine its heritage, which we don't want to do. Um, so with that in mind, we've sort of been driven into this project with two very sincere and distinct aims. One is how we find a commercially viable route to spend the best part of uh, 17 million pounds restoring the town hall in a way that's commercially viable for us, but also how we find uh, a means of creating a really positive uh, community benefit as part of that that is genuine and authentic. So I thought I'd start by talking about half of the building that will be you know, much more the commercial hub. Um, our vision here is to create uh, a diverse workspace hub that will be for SMEs, local businesses, um, across a diverse range of businesses from tech, media, creative industries, all the way through to musicians, lawyers, accountants, and everything in between. This is you know, really an inclusive place that will provide best in class workspace for a range of different people. Um, with that comes jobs, and that's something we you know, think is vitally important to think about. So starting with how we build the building, we're committed to working with Southwark to ensure that our construction company employs a number of local people to give them apprenticeships during the refurbishment. When the building's finished and operational, we'll be operating it ourselves, as we do many of our buildings. That will mean and require that we'll have to hire 20 local people, or 20 people to run the building. And our intention is to partner with Southwark Works to ensure that all of those job opportunities get offered to local people first. And then finally, across all the businesses that will be working here, we think approximately 370 people will be based in the building. Those are hopefully new jobs to the area um, and new people that will invigorate um, the community. Um, we want a really diverse mix of 
businesses here, and that requires providing a really diverse mix of spaces. So across the building, we intend to create a mix of creative offices, which will be small suites available for a small company to lease for six months, 12 months, two years. Those will be plug and play with desks, chairs, plug sockets, and internet all already provided, so you can just move in. Um, we're going to create two large co-working spaces, one within uh, the old council chamber and one within the reference library that will be uh, providing desks that you can rent for a day, a week, a month. Uh, and I'll talk about those rooms in a little bit more detail. On the ground floor, we want to create a, a small suite of small maker space units for local artisans, fabricators, designers, architects who are working a little bit more with their hands and are a bit more studio-like to be able to experiment, design, and, and create things. Um, here are a couple of the images just to give you a sense of what some of those spaces might look like. This is a, a small office suite on one of the upper floors. Um, and the future, future council chamber uh, in this guise fitted out as an open co-working space. Beyond that, um, there's a much broader range of activities we'd like to see happen here. Um, we're intending to fit out uh, one of the rooms upstairs as a photography studio. We want to create a fully fitted music studio that will be available for private hire. And across the basement and lower ground floor, where the ceiling heights are great and there's very good natural light, we'd like to partner with uh, an educational group to operate uh, an art hub, uh, very similar to the Art Academy uh, who are currently inhabiting a lot of the building. Uh, and we've already had some preliminary discussions with, with them about potentially being the partner. Um, so you can begin to see how that starts to look in, in a bit of a cross-section of the building. Uh, hopefully this illustrates that throughout um, the building there will be a very diverse mix and range of, of activities happening within the, within the commercial spaces. But I think it's probably fair to say um, community thinking has really driven um, the shape and thinking on, on all of our proposals. Uh, as I said earlier, for 150 years, this building's been the beating heart of this community uh, and a focal point for everyone. And I think the challenge that we set ourselves at the beginning of this project was how do we ensure for the next 150 years that this building remains a focal point for the community whilst at the same time finding a uh, commercial solution to funding the refurbishment. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that the property developer community doesn't have the world's best reputation speaking to local communities and making promises about what they're going to do for local people. Um, and more often than not, when they do, it's about ticking boxes on a, on a checklist of what needs to be done. Um, so I, I want to make clear, and hopefully it will be evident when I talk through some of the plans, that we've tried to think about genuine, authentic, and actually useful ways that we can provide services and facilities within this building that the community actually want and need. Um, that's an unfortunate. Jacob, just a couple more minutes, please. I'm, I'm almost done. So it's very fortunate that we're in the ground, hall, uh, we're in the ground floor of the former library uh, right now because that's really where a big part of our community thinking is focused. So this room has been a library for the community for a very long time. Um, we wanted to um, propose something that would ensure this remains a community space forever. So this room, together with the rooms on the other side of the corridor, is something we want to create as part of the building called the Society Room. Um, the room will be a 100% free-to-use room only for community groups, local schools, local residents, cultural users, or charities. We will not charge one pound for it forever, and it will be open for people to use 365 days a year, seven days a week, full stop. Um, we want to see art exhibitions happening here, cultural talks, educational activities, creative events, uh, programs that will you know, provide benefits to elderly people, young people, uh, people from across the borough, across a you know, range of different backgrounds, um, so that 
everyone has you know some benefit coming to them from this building to ensure that this isn't a pipe dream and it kind of peters out in two years time once this process is all is all done and finished we're proposing to partner with uh, Southwark Council the Woolworth Society and a number of other groups uh, to create a broad a, a, bo a board um, who will decide you know different groups uh, needs across the borough and provide them use of the space as I said for free for a week a month uh, a day, what, whatever they require. Any money that they might make from selling tickets will be 100% for them to use to fund their organisations. Um, education is hugely important for us. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we are actively partnering with local schools, with local cultural groups, with local charities to make sure there are talks, events, activities that are really providing a benefit within this space that people can use all the time. Um, just across the hall, um, we want to create a permanent artist studio space. Again, that will be gifted uh, every three months to another local artist for free. We're very cognizant of the artist studio need in London. It's something we do on all of our projects. Um, so we want to have a rolling three-month artist studio bursary at the end, giving them the space of this room to do a one-week exhibition of their work. Um, the memorial garden, after some light gardening work that we would plan will be open to the public uh, forever. The central courtyard um, that will sit behind the new cafe that will spill out onto Woolworth Square is a courtyard that will be open for everyone all the time. Uh, and one of the things we've asked Southwark if they can accept and we can partner on together is we'd like to install display cases all the way around that courtyard which will house a permanent but rotating uh, part of the Cumin collection. So that collection, which has been connected to this building for a very long time, will, will remain here and will be continually refreshed so people can see it and engage with it every day of the week. Um, the cafe, we want it to be healthy and great, but also affordable. We want everyone to be in it all the time, uh, both people working in the building and living across the road. Um, and finally, the, the council chamber and reference library, we recognize that so many events, celebrations, um, and interaction in these spaces in particular have been had over the past 150 years for the local community. Um, I'll be honest and say that we tried at the beginning to work out a way to make these permanent community spaces, but we couldn't make the numbers work to fund the restoration. So what we've proposed, as I said earlier, is that during the day there'll be co-working spaces. Um, and you might remember the co-working CGI that I showed you. On evenings and weekends, the chairs disappear, the desks and tables disappear, and that exact same co-working space becomes an event space that people can hire for weddings and other celebrations uh, so that it remains you know, a key part of uh, the important moments of, of people in the community's life. Um, Sixty-four percent of our ground floor will be open to the public at all times, forever, and just under fifty percent couldn't quite get the numbers there will be open to the public either through uh, the society rooms or different events that can happen in some of the available spaces that people can book out for private use. Um, I guess I want to sort of end by saying you know, most developers in the property world sort of see. Um, this sort of development as a big trade-off and fight between what's private and what's for the public and whatever goes to the public the developers losing and whatever goes to the developer uh, the communities losing um, hopefully what you've seen from what we've presented and what we do on our other projects we don't really believe in that I think as so long as you can get the balance right the community can benefit from a, a commercial creative hub and a creative and commercial hub benefits from being a part of the community. Um, this building has been massively important for 150 years and you know, we see ourselves as you know, potentially, if we're lucky enough to win, being custodians of, of that heritage and that history and you know, we hope we can create something that will you know, really give it a new lease of life uh, for the next 150 years. So, thank you. So, would it be possible to put the lights on so it's... Um um, so we can 
have the Q&A now. So what we'd like to do now is have a question and answer. It's, there's probably about an hour to go, so maybe if we sort of think roughly in terms of half an hour questions for the two bidders and then maybe half an hour's worth of questions for, for um, Southwark Council, something, something like that. So how do you want to, does one of you want to come up from each of the bidders and we'll have Q&A, do you want to take it from the seats or how would you like to do it? <laughs> okay. You may not know this, but Jacob and I okay. are actually quite friendly, so we'll take it together. <laughs> so. Okay, so questions, questions for Charlie. Yes, not, not very much about the sure. economics. Um, I'm interested, who's going to own the building, who's going to put up the money, and who's going to take the risk if you don't get tenants or you know the revenue doesn't exceed costs? Because there's been very little said about that, and it's a huge undertaking. So, so I, I think, and I'm probably speaking for both of us, but Michael will confirm, um, the intention at least for our bid is that Southwark Council will grant us uh, a long lease of the building, 150 to 250 years, depending on where we get to. Um, we will fund 100% of the refurbishment ourselves, albeit we are in discussions with the council about uh, a two million grant from the insurance monies that the council receives when the, when the building uh, is on fire. Uh, but other than that, we'll fund 100% of the restoration. Um, if we are unsuccessful in leasing it, it will be our money at risk. Um, as I showed you at the beginning, we developed um, a million and a half square feet of uh, creative office buildings in heritage assets across London. Um, all of them, I'm fortunate enough to say, have been profitable, um, both in terms of uh, achieving the financial return that we needed, but also in terms of creating you know, a diverse workspace and, and, and community hub within it. So. Where's the money coming from? Uh, so we're backed by... Two million to the council, where's the other three? The other, uh, so it's coming from a private family trust that we work with on multiple projects across London. They um, and us would intend to own this building for at least the next 10 years, if not the next 50 years. Uh, the trust owns 250 million pounds of buildings across London uh, and typically has owned each one for between 30 and 50 years. So they have a very long term vision. Uh, and I think in the hopefully unlikely um, uh, situation whereby the costs do slightly spiral out of control because we're all aware that working on heritage buildings does involve a fair amount of risk. We're looking at our, our payback on the building over a, a fairly long period of time. Um, we see Woolworth and Elephant and Castle as an area we really believe in and see the building as a building and opportunity that we really believe in. And if would be one of the few times we've overspent on, on our projects because we're quite good at budgeting and cost control. But if it is one of those times, we're, we're more than capitalised to be able to fund uh, any overspend, which hopefully will never occur. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah. So uh, from our perspective, we, um, uh, myself and my partner are directors of a fund that receives its funding from UK and US pension funds. Um, so that fund is about, uh, well, it has no leverage actually at the moment and has about 250 million pounds worth of net value. Um, so it's quite a substantial uh, fund. And that fund would be paying for all of the refurbishment costs. Um, we have uh, been able to make the numbers stack um, without uh, the insurance uh, proceeds, so that maybe is uh, a, a, a point of difference. Um, but uh, in terms of the refurbishment works, uh, we carry out refurbishments of our own all around the country, so um, have done quite a lot of work on, on the cost of that. If the works went over budget, that's our risk, um, but the fund has the 250 million pound value sort of capacity to to sustain an extra uh, a couple of millions of pounds or ev even more um, were, were things to go over budget. Uh, and that fund, again, is sort of a long-term vehicle that's you know, uh, backed by pension funds. So, so in our case, um, 
we, uh, we, we would be using that. Yes. Uh, you'll hear me for that mic. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Just for recording purposes. Okay, right. Um, so, uh, right, T two couple of points really. The first one is, um, again, the presentations were, were, were very, very similar in the same respect that what they didn't really show was anybody in a wheelchair or any elderly people or anybody who was handicapped or anybody who was frail. Can you both assure me, yeah, that Disabled people will have 100% access to all parts of the building. Yeah, that's the first bit. The second bit was I didn't feel very, I didn't feel very green to me. I did, I, I, I'd love to see some solar panels. I want to hear about uh, how you're going to make the place. You know, the, the first thing I want to see when I go to a building, I want to see recycling bins outside. And when you're here in Woolworth, what we need to see outside is when we walk up, we need to see a weapons bin somewhere where people can dump their knives. Because if you want to make this a safe place for people to study and for people to work, they need, they need to have that assurance that it's somewhere where there's no gang activity, there's, no, there's nothing like that, yeah? So bear, bear that in mind. But particularly with the, with, the, with the wheelchair access, we're an increasingly aging population. You know, all the people who are always sort of presented in the presentation, they're all fit and young and healthy and they're all you know, out and go-getting. That's, that's, that's not what we're I can, sure. So very similarly, we have a project that we're undertaking in Hagerston, um, which is the old uh, Victorian bathhouse. And that is one where we've been able to make the entire building um, DDA compliant. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the ability to work with uh, Heritage England to make certain tweaks and changes to the building. You probably know that in, maybe in the past, um, the DDA compliance wasn't obviously something that people thought about in 1860, and so, um, you know, or it existed. And so, uh, you know, buildings weren't set up for that. So in order to make it compliant um, in Hagerston, we've had to make small tweaks. But the fact that they were okay with that meant that we were able to do that. Um. Two, two parts to your question. So on the disability access, um, I'm not gonna be unfair and put my things back on, but you might remember in the middle of the courtyard, we're planning to build a, a new lift shaft there to replace the toilet block that's sitting between the two buildings now. Um, that allows us to give uh, disabled lift access all the way through the building, uh, which it obviously doesn't have at the moment. Uh, and it's the, it was on, on the screen, one of the key reasons why, why we're doing it. Uh, I think it's, it's vitally important. And it's it's not even a point to be discussed. It's a, it's, mm. it, it, it's, it's a must do rather than mm. anything You're else. Both pledging one hundred percent access. It, it's already the, well. Yeah. Uh, we. I will. I will. I'll add, I'll add an asterisk to mine. Uh, I'll probably our, also our, our lift does not go up to the third floor, ah. which is a tiny amount of space. Uh, I think overall it's about two and a half percent of the building. Uh, it doesn't go up to the third floor, which just has one single office suite, uh, because discussions with our heritage consultant felt if we pulled that lift shaft and staircase all the way up to the third floor, it would really compromise uh, a lot of the listed elements of the building. Um, it's something we will assess with Heritage England if, if we're lucky enough to move to the next stage, but we're, we're, we can, I can confirm we're 97 and a half. On, on, the, um, on the sustainability, uh, and the green side of things. We've kind of undenied a, a bit um, in our designs in terms of, are we gonna stick tons of high-tech air conditioning into this building? Most, most modern offices that we do, in fact, almost all modern offices that we do include air conditioning. Uh, and actually we decided quite early on that we weren't going to, um, kind of for two reasons. One, to make it work, it meant that we had to uh, start cutting a lot of holes across the building to put ducts and pipework to make it work. And it, it really started to compromise the heritage of the building in a way we didn't really feel comfortable. Um, air conditioning tends to require a huge amount of energy and power. Uh, it's not particularly 
energy efficient compared to an old fashioned building which has got a central heating system uh, and a window that you open on the occasional times London's hot enough that you need, you need to be cooled down. Uh, but we decided early on that it would be much more beneficial to the heritage of the building and much better from a sustainability standpoint to ditch air conditioning, um, which was a, a big decision, but something we you know, took quite early on, uh, which massively improves the sustainability credentials of the building and drastically reduces the, the power requirements too, um, which, is a, which is a big plus. Um, across all of our buildings, we're, you know, we aspire to always achieve the highest sustainability rating on, on anything we do. Michael, did you want to come back on the access? And the sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so very similar. We have actually a very similar view on this one. Uh, we just finished the refurbishment of a grade B listed building with, in Scotland, which is a grade two listed building equivalent, sort of here in England. And um, the funny thing that we found out, and you know, Jacob probably has similar experiences, is uh, we didn't provide, we didn't put air conditioning into that building either. Um, and that was a beautiful old warehouse built in 1901. Um, but what we found is actually the rents that the tenants are paying are the same, regardless of whether there was air conditioning or not air conditioning in the building. So I think that people today realize that sustainability is so important that they're willing to, as Jacob said, open the window on the one or two days that it's actually hot. Um, and they don't need to feel like they're in, a, in, in an ice box, you know, 365 days a year. Great. Oh, thank you very much. Mine is a three-part question. I've just thought of it while I was sitting here while you were talking. Um, what is the cost so far to both of you, if it's not a secret? Mm -hmm. What's the cost of... Do I'll do three together. We'll try and remember. Okay. Okay. Well, you're all young, aren't you? So do you remember? <laughs> and the other one is, um, how long is the lease for? And the third question, I think I did get part of the answer earlier on, but I'll ask it again. Most of the parts of the building that you're going to transfer, it, during the night time, the evening, it could be converted to be used from the day use to night use. I'm hoping that the rest of the building won't be like that because people, when you get to a certain age, we don't come out at night, so we would like something for the daytime while we can see where we're going. So that's my... Th so, Jacob and Mike. Sure, John. Um, question one on the cost. Was that, how much is the cost of the project? Yeah. So, uh, we think the total cost of the project to us will be an investment of just under £17 million. One, one seven, just under. Um, question two. I'm so, trying to remember. Slip, slip my mind. How long um, will the lease be? Oh, uh, 250 years. 200 and what? 250 years. Councillor, you're listening. <laughs> and, okay, no, that's fine, got that. and, 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 and the council will receive a, a percentage of the income that we generate from the building. And finally, question three. Um, if you remember the hub, the little square, the, so, the council chamber that you, you can use at night, converted from daytime, is any other part of the building you do this to remember? It's not good converting it just tonight. Sure. Older people have come out after this, so the entirety of this room and the entirety of the room behind you will be given over to the local community forever, for free, from seven o'clock in the morning would probably be the earliest you could take it from uh, until midnight, but seven o'clock in the morning every single day of the year for free. Other parts of the building, the cafe, the courtyard will be open from seven in the morning and open to use as well. Okay, sure. Um, so uh, our costs, I think, are coming out at around 20 million pounds. Um, so not too far off uh, Jacob's figures. Um, but obviously that all depends on, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that I, uh, you know, we've come across on a lot in, in our experiences over in Hagerston, for example, we went through a very similar process where we had consultation with the community and an event very similar to this. And everybody on the, on the property development side thinks that, you know, if they're, if they're successful, that's it. That's the end, right? Well, it's actually just the beginning, right? And so 
I think, um, as the councillor was saying, it, it, this is the start of a consultation process for whoever is ultimately brought forward. So I think that we all have to recognize that the numbers are probably a bit in flux. Um, but, uh, but thankfully, I think we're well capitalized to, to, to handle any sort of eventuality. So about 20 million pounds right now. Um, the second question was... Like ah, uh, similar, I would say, uh, 250 years with a, with a portion, 5%, I think it was, of, of, the, uh, of the proceeds or of the revenues going back to, to, to the local council. Um, but that's not, a, that's not a hard figure for us. It could be less than that. Uh, <laughs> and then daytime. Yeah, I think it's a very much a, um, very much a, probably a question for Southwark in terms of what what they what they're what they're willing to provide in terms of a lease, uh, and then in terms of daytime uses, um, yes, we have we have uh, we have we have a substantial amount of the building given over towards daytime uses. Um, again, uh, w the num the, the spaces are probably a bit in flux right now in terms of which ones they would be. But very much like Jacob, we definitely can dedicate and can commit to dedicate certain parts of the building to be used for free for the local community to hire out. Hi there, I have two questions. Um, the first, you both mentioned uh, the history and heritage of the building, and for me it's very much about the library. And I, I didn't notice, or perhaps you, that seems to be something that's really dropped off, unless I didn't that's see that. And we'll, we'll pick that up with Southwark in a minute, because the dialogue is really Okay, that's fine. Um, and then my second question is, um, often with these developments, um, some things are promised, but there aren't mechanisms in place um, that the companies are held to account to make sure things are delivered with regard to what you mentioned, with um, space for the community, um, free use, uh, studio art studios, mm -hmm. things like that. And I'm just wondering, um, from your ends, what mechanisms you see mm -hmm. that are in place to make sure you deliver the kind of things that even early in this stage could potentially fizzle out sure. as the process goes through. Uh, I'll, I, can I answer that first? Um, so what, again, I go back to the, to the, to the example of Hackney. Um, what Hackney Council did was, in that lease, however long it ultimately may be, Norma, um, the, the council has a provision which says, we only will grant you the lease. You do the works now. We will grant you the lease when what you've done is in compliance with what you've said you've you're going to deliver and so that's effectively how that works right so you're out there as a developer we're spending you know 20 million pounds at risk until you actually do what you say you're going to do and that's usually how a lot of councils deal with these these um these, these promises and making sure that the developers are held accountable to them i suspect it would probably be pretty similar in this case yeah I, I, I see a slightly different take. I, I think part one of how this project ultimately is going to work is, is in my view, as Michael said, you know, we'll, we'll have an agreement with the council that we develop the building, and once we've developed it, you know, so long as we've met our obligations, we'll, we'll get our lease at the end. But to me, it's what happens for the next 50 or 100 years that is ultimately what you know, local residents need to be thinking about. Cause it's all well and good that the developer promises or will convert this space upstairs at night into an event space that you could hire, but once they've got the 250 year lease, where's, where's the guarantee? So what, what we've proposed to Southwark with, with our project is uh, all of this big ground floor space, the society room that we're calling it, uh, is documented in the lease, which is granted for maybe not 250 years, but a long period of time. Uh, that this space is irrevocably forever legally binding in a fixed lease registered at the land registry that it can never be used for anything other than free events for community groups, local schools, local residents, uh, non-for-profits, cultural institutions. We can never make any profit from it whatsoever. Any revenue that any of the groups that use, from this, uh, that use this space are kept with them to help fund their organisations. That's 100% fixed into the lease. We can never ever move away from that. Um, equally with other parts of the public access, uh, you know, the ground floor, the courtyard, you know, these are spaces that you know, we want to be gifted over to the community. There needs to be provision in the lease that you know, gives Southwark and local residents comfort that that's not a you know, 
an easy to offer promise at nights like this that is actually something that gets followed through and is, is protected. Ultimately, you know, this is a community asset right now. You know, the proposal is to for the council to enter into a public private partnership, but the public aspect of that private partnership needs to be, in our view, fully secured for the term of the lease and, and that's what we're willing to, to accept and you know and, and place on ourselves in terms of you know, what we're offering. Uh, my first question to both of you really is, uh, are, would, you, would you accept a covenant on this building, uh, which, I mean, for example, when we talk about uh, uh, the general uh, company here, uh, he talks about, and I did pick up the point, about buying, the word buying. And, 250 years is a long, long time to, 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 to have a, a piece of property. Uh, none of us will be in this room. We won't be here. We'll be dust uh, 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 as such. And the way you developers move on and you pass this on to this company and that company, it gets lost in time. Now, what I want to know is, would you, both of the developers, whatever one we choose or whatever one the council choose, in fact, the council should put it out to to public tender to say which one do we want? That's basically what it is. Uh, you know, you're, you know, how long will you keep it for? You know, because you're talking about selling. You're at some time or other. You haven't mentioned it yet, but it, but it, but it may well be in your plans at some some time down down the so road. Should we just take yeah, that? Yeah, take that one because I've got another. I've got I another know, couple of questions. So I think there's the issue of how long you're going to keep it for, and then the degree. Oh, would you accept a covenant on yeah, the building? Yeah, it being these things. Because it, 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 is, it is community property at this moment in time. It's not your property. Okay, it belongs you, to the uh, community. Do you let them so I think, you know, I, as I said just before, you know, we we're totally cognizant of the fact that right now this is a this is a public asset and. It's a public asset entering into a, a private partnership uh, of sorts. And you know, I think the challenge in this, in this project is you know, 16 or 20 million pounds needs to be spent in order to restore uh, this building and bring it back to, to active use. Uh, and, and that's you know, squarely falling on, on, on Mike or our shoulders. Um, so you know, first and foremost, the time in which we're given uh, ownership of the building un under the lease needs to be a you know significant enough period of time you know to recoup our you know to recoup our investment in the project and also you know quite frankly to make a you know a reasonable enough return on our investment to, to justify the risk because you know don't get me wrong there is a, a huge amount of risk in restoring a building of this nature that you know has had fire damage and is, is listed you know is 100 percent speculative so you know there's nothing speculative about so, it. So, it because, so, fi so finding you've that balance is key. Um, as I said, you know, the trust that we're we're working with um, has owned the vast majority of their buildings for at least thirty years, and some of them fifty. They are they and we are, are long term owners uh, of, of of property. Having said that, you know, no one can commit to holding on to anything forever. And part of the reason, you know, I addressed the question just before that, you know. In our proposal, the lease that we are happy to be granted and the covenants we're happy to accept guarantee forever that the community benefits that our project is promising. No, I'm talking, I'm talking about the forever. building. I'm talking about the yeah. total building, not, not, not just the community assets of it, the whole of this building. Would you be prepared to sell, uh, to sign a covenant on this building uh, as such with the council? That's all to, I want to know. A, a covenant promising what? Covering what the building is, that the asset of the building will always remain an asset of the community, which, is, which, which was paid for by the community. It wasn't paid for by you, it was paid for by the community through local taxes and as such. And all I'm asking for you as a developer, or any, and you as well, uh, would you be prepared to sign a covenant to say that it's still community property? I think, Not I yours, think, I think, you, I think you it naturally is. It. Right? Excuse me, I wrote it down here. You're prepared to sell or buy. The word is buy. You use the word buy. 
I think I think no, no I, 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 I just, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be in the same position that Jacob would be I think that as because it's a lease it is owned by the community it is owned by Southwark right but technically the building is still then always owned by Southwark if it's if all we're getting is a lease so the freehold so of the building in the freehold of our oh, interest. Again, the lease, that's, that's yeah, that's right. So the freehold, the freehold will always remain. Freehold will always yeah, remain in Southern Ten. Two hundred fifty years is a long time. Two hundred fifty years uh, is a long time. Yeah, I, you know. I hope I'll be around still. So. I, well, I hope you would be. <laughs> you may have a, a longer beard. <laughs> so my second, my second question is that you both of you intend to alter the fabric of the building, one with the entrance onto the square, and the other one, uh, the roof. On the back of the building. Hmm. Now, it has it has a, a, a grading on the building, at, yeah, mm -hmm. and that should not be altered. That that roofing should stay as it is. What you're trying to do, and I can see what you're trying to do because I wrote down, hmm. uh, you as a company, uh, 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 Cable Forge is is Castle Forge is uh, is trying to create uh, five to six hundred jobs. That's what you said. You you also said that you're trying to create 370 jobs. So there's a big discrepancy in jobs there, you know what I mean? Well, what are you going to do? Uh, if you're going to extend the building, like Ian intends to do, there's going to be extra suites in the building somewhere or other, uh, as such. How many suites are they? Or you keep on talking about the numbers of possibly. You're going to alter the building dramat dramatically to actually get those numbers of suites in there to, so that you can make your, your so, so uh, 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 these are the only things that I've heard that's good. Okay, so, yeah. so which, uh, just, one, just yeah. one more minute, Jeremy, is that you're prepared to get into some sort of partnership with the council so some of we can fill some of the money back to come back to the community. Yeah. That's, that's what you said. That's so so we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're explicitly not trying to alter the building. Sorry. Our, our, alteration, me, but there could be many more our, our main alteration to the building is simply the new entrance on Woolworth Square with the, with the new staircase. But it's still with the Jim, Sure, so that, 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 that just, just, just so you're aware, that proposal was something that was thought about for the building uh, two or three years ago. Um, while that was going on, there was a huge amount of discussion with Heritage England about whether that was an appropriate alteration to, to make or not. Uh, we've also had discussions with Heritage England and we're also working with London's leading heritage consultant and I think the collective feedback we've had is that is an appropriate minor alteration to a listed building which will provide such a significant public benefit to improving the permeability of the building that it's most definitely supported at all levels of the heritage community uh, as being a balance that is, is definitely in favour of making such a, such a change. Elsewhere, we've pretty much resisted infilling or adding or, or making any meaningful changes to the building, so much so that we've actually ditched air conditioning just so we don't have to make changes to, you know, too many changes to the building. Um, I'd, want to protect I'd, I'd similarly answer the question that we're not going to be doing anything that we are not allowed or permitted to do. Anything that we would do in terms of altering the fabric of a building would be something that, like Jacob, uh, based on his consultations with Heritage England, is something that Heritage England would allow. Um, I think Jacob's done tons of refurbishments of listed buildings. We've done tons of refurbishments of listed buildings. And you know, right now we're on site on a grade one listed building up at you know, the Albert Docks in Liverpool. And you have to consult with Heritage England and just to make sure that you're not allowed to do any, you're not, you're not doing anything you're not permitted to do. So we wouldn't take any works to this building that were not permitted by, by consultation with, after consultation with Heritage England. Okay. So, so we've, had, we've had nearly half an hour questions for the Heritage England and Heritage England. Is there any more, any more burning issues that people might have otherwise we'll move on to, to something? Steve? So, oh. Uh, the, uh, get confused between who's doing what and it's all blending into one but what I do like is the idea of having a, an informal community space like a hub because we don't really a lot of, that we are having have gone down so I like so I'd like it to be a, there as much as possible maybe in the evening so I mean 
so with the cafe, I mean, saying healthy, but I mean, what? I, we want a, a wide range of food. It doesn't have to be sort of sandals and beards, you know, proper food and um, affordable. And, that, and it's great. That, and if, and it, you know, people can come in and interact and share ideas. You know, we're a bit different from other people when you go around places like Shoreditch and places like that. You know, you've got a different mix of people here. And it's great if we can all mix together in this informal space. So I hope it's there as large and as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, okay, I t absolutely agree. And in fact, in Glasgow, in our service office, uh, creative office um, business, we have right now 10% of the area is used as a lounge and create and sort of a community hub. And what we did was we, we, we got a local um, cafe operator who has three other cafes in Glasgow to operate this one as his fourth. And so it's a benefit for people who work in the building, but equally you're allowed to come into that building from outside, even if you don't work in the building, uh, as a way to, to, uh, to just come in and, and sit down and interact with everybody else in the community. So we've already done that, I totally agree, and that's something that's going to be a prominent feature. I think day in the life example of Kind of community engagement with this building from from morning to night in, in the context of that you know on a tuesday morning this room might be occupied by the Woolworth society would have gifted it to them for free to you know run them you know a, a Woolworth themed event for a month this will be hopefully full of you know a wide range of people from the community you'll meander out the back door into the courtyard, which will be a fully open public to use space with informal seating areas that you can you know, sit and make yourself comfortable. Hopefully interspersed between all of that will be items of the Cumin collection and flowing quite seamlessly into that will be the cafe, which yes, we do aspire to, if I'm honest, promote healthy food in, in all of our buildings. We think actually, you know, that's a means of you know, providing a positive benefit to, to communities. Um, you know, that might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I, I do think you know, it's an important thing that you know, we as landlords and we as operators really try and promote, particularly for younger generations that we're trying to engage in our buildings. You know, helping people to understand that healthy food can be delicious and accessible is, is, is a really important thing. Um, you know. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'd just like to take one more question to this, because I think we need to get on to something. I've got a question from Melissa. Is there a, okay? Um, is there going to be any space designated? I think you've kind of alluded to it, but I'm not. Just to clarify, is there any space for someone off the street to walk in and sit down, read a book, possibly have a sandwich? Just not expected to spend any money, not expected to hire a space. Will there be space for people to just come and talk and sit down and that's it? No hiring, no money involved. Yes. No buying coffee. Just No buying coffee. <laughs> the courtyard in the middle. Hangout open, accessible inside, to the public. Though, not outside. It's, like it's a, it will have like a kind of fake yeah. If it's covered. winter, unfortunately warm. warm. It would be lovely to have it as an open veranda basking in the sunshine, but Unfortunately, other than on a CGI, we know London very rarely looks like that. So yes, it will be covered, heated, warm, safe. Across all of this space, there will only be public events, charitable activities. I mean, not just that, they're like somewhere for someone to come in and sit down and just like relax. For so minutes. this will be 90%, this room will be 90% open across a range of different activities that will encourage and allow anyone to walk off the street and come and hang out, as will the courtyard. The cafe will be operated by us with one of our partners. You know, we want it to be an informal space. No one will be asked to leave if they haven't ordered a coffee. Equally, no one will be charged three pounds fifty for a flat white either, because you know that's where London is going. You know, affo affordable food that's a bit healthy uh, and accessible is it's kind of what we want to create, which is as much for the people upstairs as it is for the, for the local community. Michael, uh, same answer, very short. Yes. That's exactly what the cafe in Glasgow is. Uh, that that allows people to do that. No one gets so kicked no out because they're pressured they're, to buy no one's pressured it's a to buy. You can sit there and buy a coffee if you want. That's right. I think that in Glasgow, if somebody got pressured to buy something, 
or get out. <laughs> no, it's um, they they I mean, they they, they, would, they would they would they would start they would start fighting them. So uh, it, it's uh, you know they could be they could be a little bit. Because we've got some there. very low income people, and it is pressure. Absolutely. People don't go to places they don't want to feel like yep. they're imposing. So. so any sort of outdoor space, similar sort of situation. No, it's uh, it's not going to be enclosed. Okay, I've got Peter and the Roth. So Peter now, sorry. A fairly obvious question, but it's one of the elderly who may not be around to see it eventually happen. How long is this all going to take to do? Um, well, ho hopefully one of us will know if we're, we're the lucky winner in the spring. Um, we foresee it taking six to nine months to, you know, to continue the public consultation, finalise the designs, submit planning permission, uh, and then we will start the refurbishment work immediately, which we think will take just under two years, we'd like to push the team to go a bit quicker, um, but realistically given you know, the heritage nature of the building, uh, you know, it's probably two years to refurbish it. So hopefully with the following wind, three and a half years from today, and you most certainly will be there <laughs> to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah similar, similar timeline, exact similar timeline. Um, we don't... Uh, as part of this, we won't be reliant on any bank to finance the project. So it's uh, a lot of instances you know, might have with developers of they have the ability to go forward, but only if some bank gave them money to actually move forward with it. We're fully capitalized, which means that however fast Southwark from a planning perspective wants to be and however fast contractors can be um, is how fast it's going to get delivered. I think financially we're exactly the same. Peter, thank you very much. Angela. I do, first of all, want to say thank you to both of you because what you're offering, I think, is a much more creative solution than some of themselves could ever have thought of in a million years. So thank you very much for that. And, um, but I do, it is a slight negative in that you talked about the creative industries. And I am one of many practitioners in the area who need much bigger space. So it is negative, but hopefully it's something that Southwark will take on board because you're talking about very specific desk space, mainly businesses, creative, yes, but for practitioners who are making sculpture or photographs or any physical, where they need physical space, you're not offering that in any respect. And having had an exhibition here, it is important that you're providing that space for the community. So I, I honestly do thank you for your plans and schemes, but I think a lot of the questions, especially 250 years, that's a freehold. That's a freehold, isn't it? And what Southwark is going to offer, because they talked about, oh, 20, 20 million is too much for them to do the work that's needed. And, and one of the gentlemen has talked about 70 million, which comes quite a bit lower than Southwark was talking about. So I'd be impressed to see what you're actually doing with the one you're talking about. So can, you, can, we pick that up? can we pick yes. that up with Southern Yes, really good point. yes. So so very quickly, do you want to respond to either of those points at all? Um, I, I, I do think Southern deserves a fair amount of credit. You know, our, our, both of our proposals respond to a brief, a vision <coughs> and ambition that, that Southern set for us. Uh, so you know, that, that shouldn't be forgotten. I think in terms of the money side, the 20 million versus 17. You know, we did a huge amount of work on the, the costings that Southwark did for themselves, and actually the big difference between us and them is we've chosen not to install a lot of air conditioning, which saves a large chunk of money. So it wasn't. You could have done that with imagination. So thank you. I'm just thanking you for having the imagination to see something that Southwark haven't been able to. Thank you. Okay. Mike, what do you want to pick up on any? I usually don't get thanked at uh, public consultation meetings, <laughs> so I don't, I'm speechless actually, I don't even know what to say. Brilliant. Uh, Rob, last, last question now. Um, a couple of questions on safeguarding, and you both talk about young people using the space, education. I'm interested particularly in Castle Forge's, your um, educational undertaking, you kind of mentioned that there's going to be kind of seminars and stuff, but from a school's point of view and with creative industries or the creative arts being underfunded within schools, I'm interested in how you guys, it's great that you're going to give space to schools and stuff, but kind of they might need more than that, so whether there's any plans in that. And then going back to the kind of early question around the, the, the knife pin outside, the fact that it's all open is amazing, but if you've got young people using the building or people with um, 
kind of vulnerability issues, how do you suggest you're going to kind of get that balance between somebody coming in to be able to use it to read a book versus making sure there's safeguarding in place for other users? Mike. Um, so uh, specifically on the arts uh, point, one of the things that we did up in Glasgow is when the Mac burned down, uh, we took a lot of the, um, the artists and the architects that were working up there um, uh, and gave them free space for, for, for a temporary period of time uh, in our building, uh, just because I think we recognize how important the Mac was to, to Glasgow. And so um, it's, you know, if, it, it was no, it was no sweat off our back. We, we had some free space available, so we just gave it to them. Whether it's occupied or not, it doesn't really matter to us. And so that's one of the benefits, I think, that we can provide as an operator of the, of the real estate. Say, if, if we leased it to somebody else, then it really wouldn't be our call to then give it, give the empty space out to somebody else. So I guess one of the, one of the, one of the benefits of, of our doing the operations ourselves is, is our ability to do that. So not just kind of free space, but, but other things you've mentioned, but yeah, it's something. So you price per square foot for so the artists or something, you know, if they want to rent something, how, how would you differentiate between those what you don't want to do is create a great price studio and then get Hoxton people down to fit. How, how do you make sure that you're kind of Yeah. I think you just I think you curate it well, right? I mean, bearing in mind that one of the one of the benefits that, that the, I think that, that you know that, that Adam had gone through and that we're going to implement is uh, the local community is going to benefit from a lot of the curated arts and events um, based on some local artists actually putting the program for them together. But again, I think you just have to you just have to be aware of who your tenant is. Uh, and and but but you're right. I mean, there's nothing that necessarily prevents somebody coming down from from another area. But you can sort of give priority to 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 local artists. Um, that's just something that I think that that maybe that maybe what I would say is it's not something that we necessarily have to make uh, put sort of set firm in stone but it's more just it's part of the ethos anyhow so it's something that we would always strive to do i think is probably the answer to that question um so what was the second part of it i, I think we should I, I would just have to run out of time okay so I'll, I'll just address the bit that michael addressed um we absolutely want to set it in stone so that it's clear and unequivocal and binding forever all of this space this floor the room next door free to use local educational community and nothing else um, we've operated you know we've given homes to 250 artists across london in the last 36 months in temporary buildings we've hosted i suppose the question was more to do education rather than free space because free space is fine just I, I, people put just, whereas, whereas I'm, I'm about i'm about i'm about to get there i'm about to get there um, we've hosted hundreds of events in our buildings for uh, education, schools, uh, arts, creative, community groups across a range of different buildings. Uh, we know actually what it takes on a practical level to actually put on a, an event beyond just getting the free space. It sounds like a trivial thing, but the temporary chairs, the tables, the signage, uh, the water cooler, the electrical points, all of that stuff will already be provided in this room in a hidden cupboard so that mm -hmm. someone coming and taking it has zero setup costs projectors, light, everything will be here and it's available so that it's as seamless to use as possible for these groups who I agree with you, getting a space can be great if it's free, but there's generally a cost of actually putting up you know, whatever's needed to, to run the event. And we know that because we do it all the time. And you know, I didn't put it on the screen because it's already baked into our, our thinking and, and, and a given. That was a really long session. Thank you so much, both of you. Mm. Absolutely, all the points that have been raised in this meeting will, will feed into the evaluation process. So this is not just a tick box exercise, it's absolutely critical and crucial in terms of both 
the next phase and, and, and get into a position where um, a proposal can go forward. Uh, I think it's really important to underscore that. Brilliant. Uh, Mark. Yes. So they're both talking about there's going to be Mark, some open space. Yeah. <laughs> they're both talking about there's going to be some open space, there's going to be some private hire, there's going to be parties, there's going to be uh, we've got business here, we've got education, we've got schools. You're going to need security. Will Southern Council provide the security or will one of these two uh, bidders provide the security? If they provide the security, will they provide, is it some bloke with a, with a fake sheriff's badge or are they going to have real CCTV, you know, proper security guards who know what they're doing? Because otherwise, if you've got some open space out the back where anybody can walk in and out, be a dealer's paradise. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, yeah, fair question. Um, I, 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 I believe both of the presentations alluded to um, both the security of, of the building and the management of the building. And indeed, I, I believe um, they also talked about ensuring that um, you know, those jobs go to local people as well. So absolutely, that, that would be the expectation. Um, I'm not sure if John wants that or anything else. No, that's the expectation that either party, whoever gets selected, will be looking after the management of the building. Thank you, Mark. Chief. Yeah, there's the two main issues which we're both very con all very concerned about, I think, which is what is happening with the cumin collection. They've alluded to um, putting bits of it here on a rolling basis, but I really think that you know, the council is responsible for that collection, and we, as the citizens of Southwark, really want to know what's happening permanently to the Southwark collection that is our heritage. And, uh, and also the issue of we're sitting in the old library, um, where is the new library going to be, and um, you know when will we have it? Um, in response to the first point, um, um, in response to the first point, uh, I, I know my colleague Catherine Redler would want to say say that same thing. The, the intention is always to ensure that much of the communication is out on display as much as possible. Um, you know, a couple of um, you know, one of the projects talks about community collection. And as the proposals go forward, it will be the expectation to, to take into uh, consideration the feedback given from not just this discussion, but discussion moving forward. But absolute priority is to ensure that as much as we can collection is out on display as possible. Um, and um, in respect of what that looks like moving forward, I'll leave my colleague to come back and update you on, but it's, it's, it's absolutely a priority moving forward. In terms of the library, I, you know, it's almost a shame that we're not having this meeting in a week and a half time, but it is very close for us to be able to say something on, on the library. But all we can say is... So what we can absolutely say, what we can absolutely say, what, what we can absolutely say is that um, the living the library is absolutely a priority. Um, and um, we are going to be in a position very shortly to be able to say something on the library, um, but it remains an absolute priority, um, and it's not, you know, it's not really important that further. Chief, why is the announcement? Um, well, we're sorry. I, I didn't choose myself. John Abbott from the Council's Regeneration Team. We're preparing a report for the next cabinet in, in January, January. In January. So, that money. I could possibly comment. Uh, uh, have we in, uh, thank you, uh, the next question, please. No, I did ask a question to the two gentlemen before the cost, and one mentioned 20 million, one mentioned 17. Why is there a difference between what Southwark's been telling us for? Two, three years? 40 million? Should I do yeah, yeah, yeah. John, John will be able to go into much more detail on it. But, but you know, our, you know, the, But that's the reason that's why you couldn't do it, because you didn't have 40 million. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's the, that's the, that's, as, as alluded to earlier, um, the, the valuation and the costs and the, the, the accounts that were made at the time did come up just shy of 40 million. But John, John will, will be able to make a further comment on that. Just two comments, Norma. First of all, Looking at the cost side of it, it's part of our ongoing evaluation, so we haven't reached a view on what's been put to us yet as to its credibility, reliance, 
the extent to which it deals with risks and all the other things that go on in a very difficult building. And we know how difficult it is because we did a huge amount of work on it. The second thing I would say to you, just to remind you, is the council's proposals for the building involved a library, they involved a museum space, which requires very specific sort of atmospheric and environmental conditions in order to maintain the collection. It also involved moving the council's um, marriage and civil ceremonies function from Peckham up here. So a very different range of uses, a public building that has to be fit for purpose to meet all those public requirements. And we got to actually, I think, a figure, I'm looking at, at uh, Gillian, 27 million in terms of capital costs. It's not that far off 20 million, to be honest with you, but it's a different suite of buildings. On top of that, we built in risk, contingency, uh, and other things that we, as a public body we just have to do. And it, we also have to bear in mind that the infrastructure load that went with our building was probably greater than what's been proposed by the two bidders. So those kind of costs build up is different because it's a different set of uses. And another point is that there has been quite a bit of expenditure on the building already. Yeah. So dealing with the fire, the emergency, the, um, the re-roofing, all of that sort of stuff is included in that 40 million as well. Yep. So that, that expenditure has already taken place. That was included in our so you're no. no, so I'm just saying that the cost um, that we were including in the 40 million, which I believe was about 4.5 to 5 million, um, has already been spent on the building, so it therefore wouldn't form part of the costs that these gentlemen have spoken about today. Thank you. Um, I was just interested in what uh, advice the council is getting with regard to drawing up the contract for this. I mean, it's not just a case of a, of a 250 year lease. Uh, clearly, in 30 years, the people currently bidding will probably have been retired. Um, things will change and there's an awful lot of practical issues running a building like this, particularly with uh, community events coming in that don't raise any revenue and don't raise any revenue for the operators. And I'm just thinking that it's a very tricky area and I just wondered what, what sort of advice you're getting because it's not just lawyers that you need. Well, we, as part of the evaluation, we're also drawing on... We have our own property team at Southwark, very experienced property team, there's a whole range of transactions, including working on various listed buildings over the years. But we're also using uh, advice from Montague Evans, uh, external property company, commercial advice from them as well, as part of the transaction. And, and, and crucially, it's been, again, it's been alluded to earlier, but in respect of ensuring that the, the things have been committed to, both in the engagement process, um, it's absolutely watertight and it's within the lease, that's, that's going to be a priority for that community use. It's going to be a priority moving forward. Okay, I've got Jim, Angela, Rob. So, Jim, next. Uh, especially to the councillor, mm. the person in charge of it. This is public. You know, have you thought about, I mean, neither of those gentlemen gave any agreement to, the, to a covenant of this building. You are the guardians of this building, or the so called guardians at this moment in time, or the elected people at this moment. Uh, have you ever thought about? The covenant and the time, the time thing. There's one chap there talking about a 150-year lease. Well, can't we think about bringing that lease term down in some way or other? Because it's far, far, far too much. Nobody ever gives out a, 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 a lease of, of, of 250 years. So I would think before you sign up anything, please look at the at a covenant for this building. Because, like I said before, we've paid for it, or I haven't, my grandfather paid for this, uh, and my great grandfather, because I haven't ever moved from Southwark in any way whatsoever. Yeah, so, can you really kindly look at it, please? That's, that's really what I'm asking Thank you, you as, the, as the council. That's, that's a fair question, there, man. What, what, one, one thing that we've just been talking about, and it underscores the importance of uh, the expertise that we have within the council, is saying that. This, at this point, we're very much at the proposal stage and we're very much at the engagement stage. There will be a point in which we are uh, pulling in different departments within the council to be able to ensure that uh, we are getting what has been both proposed and committed to. So you know, I appreciate it may be slightly concerning that 
uh, that element, you may not necessarily have as much information on that element as the discussion at the moment, but that element, that element of the proposal will be coming in the future. I'll, I'll just say this to end on, um, in respect of the, the, the lease term, it's been mentioned before, it's, it's balancing the fact that you do, there is capital expenditure from whichever proposal, sure whatever you proposal, whatever proposal, proposal, proposal you have. Yeah. Even when you yeah. get out and you, and you write to buy, you only give out a 125 year yeah. lease on it. And, yeah. so, and, and you're expecting to get the money back after the 125 years by, by asking people for more money at the end of their lease time. Yeah. So why give it to a developer when, when it's a community asset to begin with? That's the point yeah. I'm making. Yeah, and, and, and what I'm saying is not necessarily a discussion about the lease, the, the term at the moment. What, what I'm saying is the respect of the, the things that are being balanced in terms of getting to that figure is both the capital expenditure that's committed by both proposals and also ensuring that you are, as you quite rightly say, you're getting the community, you're getting the outcomes that the community wants to see and, and the council wants to see as well. So it's balancing those two things. Okay. I'm going to move on because we're running out of time now. So I've got Angela and then Rob. Um, this gentleman is talking about the same thing as a concern with the idea that this isn't a lease or it's a group of bond, is it? And, then, and, then, and the, as he says, it belongs to the, the community. Um, I think the guys are offering a good deal. I think it was a proper lease. But who in the council takes responsibility? I understand part of the problem is that the building was uninsured to begin with caused a lot of so who are the experts within the council who are actually making these decisions that we come this close to having two perfectly reputable groups here offering their skills what the on earth is Southern offering you know and that we're so close to these guys being offered some kind of deal and that uh, you don't even know how long the leases that you're offering so, it's so, staggering to me. Okay. Can I just come back on that? Because I think it's, it's important, um, um, maybe, I probably should have been there with before, it's important because that we are not so close to the point in terms of a deal. We are at a point which, you know, we've been fair through this whole discussion today. It's very much in the engagement process and there will be a further evaluation moving forward. But, you know, over the next few weeks, we're really keen to hear from as many community groups. We're really keen to have as much sessions like this to ensure that whatever proposals move forward are informed by the community and the evaluation process is also informed by the community as well. And so I wouldn't want people to feel like this is, you know, we're, we're rubber stamping decisions that have already been made. But, John, I'm not sure if you wanted to come back on particularly the lease point. On the lease point? I'll, 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 yeah, I'll come back on the lease point. John, John's all yeah, I'll come back on the lease point. Um, I, I know it's a sensitive issue because I've been here before and been asked questions about it. But I, I think you heard from the, the, the two bidders that obviously the length of the lease is determined by, in part, by the, the payback period in terms of the investment they're going to make. So it's going to be a long lease. We, we did say when we put the, the terms out uh, at expression of interest stage that we thought 250 years was the, the kind of reasonable level in order to ensure that payback. We also have to say at that point, we're thinking from our knowledge of the building, it's a very complex building, it's been fire damaged, it's listed, it was going to need significant amounts of investment and you know, developers raise that money in different ways and the length of the lease helps them to raise that from external funders or equity providers or debt funders. So they need some flexibility about that and we, we, we recognise there were a lot of risks there and that we need to show a bit of flexibility. We're down to two parties now. You heard from them that there's various views on the, on the length of the lease that they might need. Uh, we'll take that into account in our, our evaluation. And ultimately, uh, the, the property team at Southwark, advised by Montague Evans, will be making a, a report to the council, uh, to, the can to the cabinet, and it's their decision ultimately. But I think we all have to recognise that duration of that lease has to be of sufficient length to allow the parties to raise the funding that they need to do it. It's not exaggerated. I think you could about say for that, Jeremy. It's not 
there, there would have been there would have been insurance, and there would have been. Well, the, the council's insurance. I'm not here to answer the. I'm not the council's uh, director of finance. Yeah, I can't really comment on the insurance. What we're saying is that there was, there was, there was, there was, there was extensive there was damage. Well, yeah. The extensive damage. Yeah. Um, if, if you want to, you know, if you want to see specific yeah. information, we can I'm show you. Because we're not necessarily, you know, in terms of the specific damage, we're not, you know, be uh, other members of the council that will be able to come comment on that specific specific point in terms of damage. But um, it was well documented at times, extensive damage to the building, and, and, and it was extensive damage to, you know, particularly on that side of the building. Um, but happy to come back to you with specific points. And, you know, the chamber's gone, for example. 99% of that chamber, it does not exist anymore. It is absolutely gutted, that part of the building. Okay. That's the most historically sensitive part of the building. I'm just going to try and slowly wrap up now. So I've got Rob and then Peter and Simon. Um, when you started this process a year ago, it, Southwark was very keen for this to be a joint bid between arts and cultural um, organisations within Southwark and a developer. And it was very clear from the initial proposals that you wanted it to be a joint venture. Um, I know there's a number of us in the room that did those initial proposals and you've taken through two developers, both from outside the borough. So that's kind of my first point is that. And then the fact that they're giving free space is great. Um, but there are a number of people, you know, when you're looking at leases and renting space within their, their bids, what's Southwark's role in making sure that, you know, that, Different, different organisations locally can afford different rents um, to make sure that that balance is correct because they're going to have to have their their money is going to have to work but also there are a number of organisations us included that need kind of some kind of guidance from you guys or is it just you're looking just for kind of a one-on-one -on -one negotiation with the developers or how are you protecting the arts organisations that could benefit from paying a rent not just for the free space and how that that goes really I'll comment on First question and second question. In respect of, um, it's quite right, you identified uh, both the arts and culture as a key part of the ambition of the council for this space. And, um, you know, in an ideal world, I, I would always say this it would be good to have a, a proposal, it would be good to have a proposal, I'm sure there were proposals from, from the local area. In an ideal world, that would always be, um, that would always be a good position to be in. However, we have also tasked proposals to come forward to ensure that they're working with the local community. And both prior to this point and also moving forward, uh, part of the evaluation process is measuring that. To what degree have they worked with the local community and to what degree are they engaging with local community groups as well um, and, and art and culture as well. So, in response, in a, in a short, uh, short response to your point, um, you know, whilst it's not necessarily as you quite right, rightly identified, whilst both proposals are not necessarily based in the borough, however, they do have experience working across multiple boroughs, multiple locations. And as part of the evaluation process, we will be expecting them, and I know they have done a number of engagement uh, discussions and, 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 and held a number of engagement events, we'll be expecting them to go further and to develop strong partnerships with local community groups and strong relationships with arts and culture specifically. Um, and the second point, uh, what local groups can afford, and you know that could be counter um, counter to and their business practices. Now, is that a discussion that you're expecting the other local arts and culture groups to have with them, or will you look to protect some of the local groups? You know, say one of the towns where they've got office space, some classes of for ten pounds. What what are you expecting? Um, the yeah. group yeah. group? Do you want me to comment on that? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll say to yeah. you, yeah. if you can comment yeah. on yeah. that. Two folks, uh, very much we expect, uh, we expect that uh, the proposals to engage through uh, arts and cultural organisation and we ex and we set a we set an expectation in terms of making proposal for, for arts and cultural organisation. But then also we expect that discussion to happen naturally from our organisation and the proposals as well. And I know some discussions have been happening as well, but I'm not sure if you wanted to come back in on any of those points. Yeah, our, look, our evaluation, we've got to be careful here, our evaluation is still ongoing, so I'm not going to take a great deal at this stage, but clearly the, the balancing act in all this is, is how do you get a commercial wrap around a set of proposals that can provide for arts and cultural organisations. So that's what we're fundamentally looking at, really. Clearly the rent levels are, are part of that, but ultimately, if we select one of these bidders to go forward with, the arts organisations will be dealing directly with those operators. 
Well, I was going to ask, what is the return on investment going to be? I mean, there must be a business plan that suggests what the there's a twenty million pounds plus the additional management costs, and there will be a return on that. There must be a business plan that you know helps inform, obviously, the length of the lease to ensure that you know they make their appropriate yeah. profit. So there must be some figures. But there is. The, yeah, that's all part of the ongoing evaluation. Yeah. So we'll be we'll be considering that. But just to just to expand on the evaluation from an officer point of view, uh, this is. Will be part of the report. So what are they, they the three, to get, the three, to get back, do you think? Sorry. What sorry. sort of what sort of what sort of return are they going to get? Do you think? I can't what comment on that. I can't comment on that, man. That's going to be part of the, the report that we make to to the cabinet in due course, in the normal way that officers work with our members. That well, evaluation is not concluded but, anyway. But once it is reported to the cabinet, that's yeah. public. Uh, well, there'll be a close, and yeah, there'll be closer than that because part part there's a commercial the report, part of all this. The report itself, there'll be an yeah. element that will be open. Yeah. Of course it will, yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I've got a question on the, your left now, Julian. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Sorry. Um, on the left. Just a quick one, really, a little bit more about um, one of the uh, proposals. I mentioned uh, some form of trust um, of uh, actually acting for the community. And so I'm just wondering if that is part of the evaluation so that this body Shall I just um, talk about the evaluation? <coughs> yeah, sorry, because I, I meant to go on to explain. There's, there are three bits to the evaluation. Clearly, we're going to be, as officers and with external advice as well, looking at the commercial side of it all. What's the return to the council? Have they got a business plan that can sustain the kind of offer that they're making? Uh, the second part of it will look at the heritage aspects of what's on offer. Uh, what are the implications for the heritage, the listed building? the conservation management plan for the building, and we'll be drawing on both our internal planning team but also Heritage England to, to look at those aspects of it. And the third important part of it is what is the, the community offer, the arts and cultural offer, yeah. and that will be part of it as well. So all those three evaluation strands come together and we then make a recommendation to Cabinet. Okay, but how do you foresee that moving? How do you, how do you see that developing as a, as a body if you have this as part of your evaluation? At the moment, what, what, how do you see them interacting or, should we say, working in partnership with the building leaseholder operator at, so that those community issues and those community opportunities are retained and organised for the community? Um, yeah, I mean, is yeah. that, is that, are you, are you intending to set up? So, so it's absolutely. So, yeah, it will be recognised both in terms of the report coming into and the evaluation, um, and any agreement may will be recognised at the least. But I, I think it's part of, you know, there will be practical solutions to this. So, if a trust is set up, I imagine there will be representation from the council to be able to ensure that there's an ongoing, uh, ongoing relationship moving forward. Um, and, you know, what that, what that representation from the council would be, remains to be determined at what, at what appropriate level that would be, but there will be representation from the council. Uh, but council and community, yeah. it's a community body, so you must, they must have in part of this, sorry, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but part of this process yeah. means that you, that is really important, I would have thought to all these people here, that there is a body that's going to be representing their input or their use of the building for the for 250 or whatever number of years it might be. Absolutely, and you know when I when I mention the council, of course I, I also mean that there will be community involvement as well okay. in terms of um, community representation. What that looks like, I, I you know in terms of who particularly sits on it, but there will be community representation, and it's I, I imagine that will be discussed as we get to that point, past the both evaluation stage and and. Uh, the proposal moving forward. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to take two more questions if I may, and I'd just like to give one very short perspective before Johnson wraps up them, if I may. So Mark and then Jason. Thanks again. Yeah, um, both of these guys, you know, both both uh, groups are, are saying that you know the projects that they've previously done are fantastic, and that you know everybody who's in those projects is is thoroughly uh, satisfied. We, we obviously, you know, why don't you guys go and find out 
yeah? Go and see people at those projects. Physically go out there, not with these guys holding your hands. Go over, speak to these people, see if they're actually happy. See if they're getting value for money. See if it's logical. See if it's sensible. See if, it, see if it's viable, yeah? Then make your evaluation. We are doing that we'll as do part that. of the evaluation. That we'll will be part that. of the evaluation. Yeah. We are doing that. Brilliant, Mark. I've got Jason, and I just want to very quickly wrap up. Uh, all I want to say is, will the Council take their preferred bidder's final offer back to the Walworth Society for further scrutiny and discussion, um, or is today effectively the end of community consultation in terms of choosing a bidder and their offer and their vision, um, and all the next major decisions will just be taken behind closed doors? Sorry, can, I, can I just say that we are, you know, when the Walworth Society is mentioned, you know, that we're not party to that in a way. We are, and, and we are not the community, we are just part of this process, so please, all we've done is organise a meeting, so please don't think we have any agenda in this process, but we want to make representation, obviously. Thanks, Jason. Um, one of the first sentences I said to open it up was today starts the engagement, doesn't end it. So I think it's really important to be clear about that, that you know, engagement will continue. Even once a proposed, uh, proposal has, does move forward, they will still be engaged on both parts of that point as well. Um, it's important to ensure that we're consistently having a discussion with the community and a broad range of parties, a broad range of the community as well. So, you know, it was one of the first sentences I get sent, and you know, we're absolutely clear about that. Today starts the discussion. Just a clarification, I think it's what Mark said exactly. It's not just about sort of consultation during the planning process uh, and community engagement. That is really about choosing a particular particular bidder and their particular resources and their particular vision because one of the two might be actually much better than the other, you know, if you go and visit their actual delivered project. And they I think it's that. Sorry? And they have the already. So, so, what, so no, it reflects back to the question that's asked is that are we going to be able to go along to uh, go along and visit them? It's going to be part of the evaluation process in terms of seeing their previous examples of their work. But it's a point that, it's a fair point you raise um, and today is part of the evaluation process. Well, today is part of the process moving forward. We will take that away and see what can be done. I'm happy to come back and see um, how we ensure that once they propose to move forward we're 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 still hearing from the community as well. Can you tell me then why you you want the pending pending COVID consultation on the twenty first of January? Because I've taken down the chat on the call on the end there. I mean, you've actually said consultation, I wrote it down here, ending on the 21st of January. Mm. So that is the end. Right? Mm. Well, no, no, for this, for this particular cycle. Yeah. You know, I think there, there does need to be a, a date in which, you know, an element of the consultation ends because you, you do need to, to ensure that you're, you're moving forward with momentum. However, um, you know, again, reflecting back on one of the first uh, statements that I made, mean, which is today's starts the conversation doesn't end it. Even when we get part of the proposal, uh, preferred proposal stage, there will still be further opportunities to engage both in terms of what what happens in this space and, and, and to what degree the community have ownership of the space in terms of uh, the structure and the steering of things. <coughs> okay, well, okay. If I just might, give, just before we end, I just might give one perspective. So I think, I think. I think what we've heard from this is very interesting. I think there's a, you know, they sound coherent and viable. I'm encouraged by the fact that lots of jobs will be created, which is really good for the Walworth area. I'm encouraged, I think the fabric of the building will be respected. The architect sounds stronger. Questions about the changes, but that all sounds good. I, am, I get the sense that there's going to be quite a number of community uses for the building. Yeah, yeah. My worry, my worry is that the council plan, what we feel we have discussed, is it says in the council plan, a publicly accessible cultural hub. And what I still feel is missing is the idea of a coherent cultural offer that will be unique to Walworth that will come from this. I can see the bits, I worry about the whole. And I do think, I do think that something quite, you know, we had ideas around a heritage hub, I'm not saying that's the right thing, but I do think that the sum of the parts of the community dimension need to add up to more than they do currently. Yes. Thank you so much to General Projects and Customers. That's been an amazingly long session. Thanks to John.